Hey, welcome to another episode of Strive 365, the podcast dedicated to helping you push through challenges and thrive every day, no matter the odds. We are here to help guide you and to live a better life, whether it be mentally, physically, emotionally, or even spiritually. And I'm your host, Justin Arnold, here in the amazing Rock Vox studio. Now, today we have Andrew Brady on the show. And for the locals, you might know who he is. We've been Facebook friends for a while now. We've chatted here and there, but I was like, man, I got to have this guy on the show. Uh, if you follow him, you can see that he's a remarkable individual who embraces life, his challenges with unwavering determination and a passion for personal growth. As a president and chief evolutionary officer, which I love that title of... I might butcher this, the XLR8 team. Accelerate. Correct. Accelerate. There we go. So there we go. He has been at the forefront of guiding organizations towards transformative growth and conscious leadership. Andrew's journey has been diverse from being featured or being featured in a muscle and fitness competition for his dedication to health and fitness. That's more recently uh, to showcasing his knowledge on the iconic game show Jeopardy, which was really cool to see. And while actively participating in triathlons and engaging in community endeavors, he's proven that a purpose-driven approach can lead to a more fulfilling life so andrew welcome to the show uh anything else you'd like to add there to no that i'm just intro? gonna have to do my best to live <laughs> up to that intro i appreciate it yeah no problem like i said i've been following you for a while and it was only a matter of time but i was like man he's in the health and fitness and one of the things that gravitated me towards you is just like your positivity on facebook even uh all the things that it seems like you've been through and challenges and the things you even put yourself through as far <laughs> as competition and one of the things you said uh when we first started chatting about possibly being on here is like you uh really uh this is new to you, like exposing yourself to health and fitness. So uh, why is that? Yeah, interesting question. So, you know, I run a leadership development company. So oftentimes I'm being hired by an organization. Really what we try to do with the Accelerate team is to help organizations create a corporate culture that becomes a competitive advantage for the organization. You know, the way that it helps them attract better talent, keep them around longer, engage them at a higher level, those sorts of things. And so, uh, you know, oftentimes if you're, you know, going through a, a work training program or, or whatever the case may be, personally, I believe, and after uh, getting to know you a little bit, following you online and everything, I think it seems like you do as well, that, you know, health and fitness is, is certainly a part of, of a holistic level of how you're going to lead your life, whether, whether, you know, you're leading an organization or just trying to lead yourself or your family, uh, you know, all of that is intertwined. But, you know, sometimes if you're if you're going through a, a training program for your leadership, uh, you know, I just shied away, I guess, necessarily from from directly bringing health and fitness into that because I think that a lot of um, you know, a lot of people are struggling with that, but also organizations kind of like. Unfortunately, I in, in my view, have a, oh, here's our training and development side of our organization. And there's another element that's maybe more, here's what we do for our, you know, our fitness or, or our, our, our different elements like that. So they kind of separate it. And so I always try to live a, a healthy and fit life. And if clients would ask me about, you know, what my practices were, I was happy to share. Um, but it was a struggle to maintain the right balance to, to not push them uh, too far because I'm hired by their company to do leadership development, not necessarily to do the, the health and fitness stuff. So, so you don't start um, start them out with like a minute of burpees and let's yeah, get rocking. Yeah, on. not not always. It's it's sometimes even a struggle just to, although now it's, it's more more so kind of mainstream to be able to talk about, you know, meditation or centering or, or those sorts of things. But that was even kind of uh, woo woo for a long time. I still, I mean, you say it's mainstream and I'd like to believe so, but maybe you and I have gotten so into the health and world, but even when I venture out and, and, and still talk about meditation, at least in men's groups, when I go to those, mm. it's, uh, it's still very, it's still very tough. It's, it's, I definitely believe it's grown, but I still believe that probably the people that need it the most are probably the still ones. I'm with you it. there. Yeah. I, I think same, same thing. Yeah. You're probably right. You know, the organizations that I work with are typically those types of organizations who are really focused on, you know, their, their organizational culture and, and wellness and those sorts of things. So they might be more, more open to it, or at least have, have heard of it or, or, or at least open to trying. Yeah, right. And, and there's cool. different ways to, to introduce it, but yeah, it's same, same thing in organizations. The ones that need some of those practices the most are, are the ones that aren't necessarily ready for it or yeah. aren't open to it. 
So, so is health and fitness and wellness and all those things under the umbrella, has that always been a part of your life? Like it's just a natural thing or you've been playing sports or what? Yeah. You know, I grew up playing sports, uh, but was never, it was, I played soccer and, and tennis were kind of my two main sports growing up. Uh, but I never really, I don't know, went, went into the gym or, or did those sorts of things and, and wasn't really into, you know, running or endurance sorts of things. Like I, I, I always would joke, you know, I, I don't want to run unless I'm chasing after a ball in the soccer match or whatever, yeah, right? Those that, sorts yeah. of things. Um, but then I actually, it, it was my, my junior year of high school and I got cut from the soccer team no. and that was like that was the, probably one of the best in, in you know in retrospect one of the best things that ever happened to me because that's what made me start to take fitness more seriously yeah. uh i trained a ton uh over the course of that year preparing for my senior year to be able to be probably the one of the most most fit people on the team and so like that was one of the things that the coach said said to me at the tryouts the next year when I when I made the team my senior year was wow like you are you know every every tryout you're the first one you know sweating through your shirt and you're never stop running and you're you're always always going after it and so that was one one thing for me and then actually it's funny how it kind of ties together because then I started to think a little bit more about the nutrition aspect. Um, also from that, once I was on the soccer team, my senior year, and I think my mom had like packed me a Snickers bar or something that I was, that I was eating on the, Snickers, on the bus, yeah. on the bus to talk uh, about game. good marketing there, by yeah. the way, with Snickers. Well, they uh, turned it into food. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> they turned into protein car pre-workout. Uh -huh. snack. And, and so in my coach, like just kind of made like an offhanded comment that he probably doesn't even remember. But for me, it was like the first time that it clicked for me like oh maybe I should think a little bit more about what I'm feeling my body with and so that was really the beginning of it and the beginning of a, a pretty long journey and, and like a slow journey too I think sometimes when people try to psych themselves up for any kind of transformation they try to make too many changes at once and that's disruptive to <laughs> routines but it's also you know sometimes if you make 10 changes and then Maybe maybe it's two or three of them that are getting you the most bang for your buck. But if you make them all all at once, uh, you're not really sure which ones are are getting you the most leverage. So if you make you know small changes, kind of treat yourself like a like an experiment of one and see what makes the most difference. So for me, it was kind of a long journey uh, that I think made it more sustainable for me because I was over time figuring out what worked and what didn't for me. Yeah. And th you said this is all like junior, senior year of high school, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was, I mean, that was the, the beginning, I, I guess, you know, early on then maybe, uh, you know, so, so cutting out, you know, Snickers bars and, and processed foods and things like that. Uh, but, but then trying to figure out, I think it's important too. not, I mean, that, that's certainly important to get rid of some of the, some of the toxic stuff, but then what are you going to add in? That's going to be nutritious and, and be, you know, fueling you in the right way. So what year was this? I'm trying to get a paint a picture. Oh I'm man. Like so I was, I graduated high school in 2006. So this was, I guess like 2005 probably. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's still like the, I think that's pretty, I was trying to, so, I mean, thinking about weight room, for example, I played soccer too. Yeah. I did track and wrestling and it was actually frowned upon in the nineties. So I graduated in 99 to use weights, like in running sports and soccer, like they thought it would slow you down. Yeah. It's still in I the nineties. I'm like blown away. Like, and, and so for, and then I started just exploring it cause I've always enjoyed movement. And so it's just interesting that you in 2006, which wasn't, too much longer that you're, I think it's pretty wise and, and just, uh, very self-aware that you in high school were like, instead of, you know, some people be like, I got cut my sophomore year of high school, which motivated me, but I, I found a lot of people got cut from something just quit, Yeah, you yeah know? never so, came back. So yeah, I, I think that's awesome there. And then the nutrition, I didn't start really, I mean, I've always cared about food and nutrition and I knew it was healthy, but it wasn't until I lost my appendix that I was like, I'm going to start really diving in. And then I became a nutritionist. So it's just really cool that 16, 17, 18 years old that, where do you think that comes from? 
You know, uh, so a lot of a lot of things uh, tie back to to my dad. Okay. Um, Here we I, go. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> there, in, in a lot of different ways, it depends. We'll see which ways uh, we, we go here. But uh, so my it's dad, all positive, man. Yeah, it's all growth or learning or well, fun or whatever. So, so the company that I'm running now, the Accelerate team, was actually started by my dad in '95. And he had a 25 plus year career, started as a, as a social worker in a mm-hmm. local hospital system here and worked his way up to a senior VP role, like over a pretty successful career. Wow. And <clears throat> then walked into a performance review one day as his boss was the president of the hospital. And he was like, my dad's name's Tom. He's like, Tom, I can tell you lost a little bit of your passion. What's going on? My dad was like, you know what? I just don't want to work here anymore. And he up and quit. And so he was... 41 wow. at the time. I I had two older sisters who were, you know, in high school, you know, so college bills looming and all of that. I was seven years old at the time. Uh, so at 41, you're going to have a midlife crisis. Yeah. And quit oh, it was, it, was a, it was a midlife <laughs> crisis for sure. And, um, and so I always joke, like, I have no idea how he explained himself to my mom when he came home that day. Uh, but the way that he described it to me kind of translated into seven year old terms was there are certain things I liked about my job and certain things that I didn't. And I want to do more of the things that I liked. And so to a seven-year-old, you're like, all right, way to go, Dad. It makes all the sense in the world. And, uh, and, and so it turned out that the things that he liked were always, as he was growing in, his, in the organization, was always building his team, developing the, the team around him, uh, helping them to learn and grow, kind of being that, that coach and mentor to them. And that's what he decided to, to go do full-time. Now, shortly after that, that conversation with him, my mom and, and, and he both both sat down and were kind of like, all right, you know, we might have to take it easy on some birthdays and Christmases for a couple of years. Like, like gave me that kind of, kind of, kind of speech. might need to get rid but, of one of you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, but, but it was, it, I mean, I guess, I guess testament to really following your, your passion and, and aligning with your purpose that never really materialized. He just, you know, from a, from almost the get go really was, was successful in taking this approach that he had developed kind of in his, in his role at the hospital system and, and working with other clients to, to create again, that kind of organization that's really focused on, on culture and, and leadership and how you're, you're growing and empowering the, the people in your organization to, to live fulfilled lives, but also to be, you know, contributing and, and engaged in their organization. And so uh, that was something for him. And then, you know, just for me sitting around the dinner table growing up, learning about leadership, thinking about what is your purpose, going through being kind of the guinea pig for some of the different tools and assessments and methodologies that, that he'd be doing. And uh, and then my mom, actually, she w- had a had a 20 year career at Xerox and human resources and ended up when my dad started growing the business really quickly, uh, he actually convinced her to, to leave her job and, and join him. So then it was really the, awesome. the family dinner table conversations, having, having both of them kind of in this leadership development realm. So, I mean, from a young age, I was always wow. interested in, in being a leader and developing those skills and, you know, being the, the captain of whatever team that I was on and in those sorts of things. Uh, I joined Boy Scouts at a pretty young age with like the in, intent express purpose of wanting to become an Eagle Scout and get that like leadership yeah. opportunity and everything. So it was something that definitely was was deeply, deeply ingrained and something that I, I guess to tie back to the podcast, something that I was always striving for was this kind of alignment with my purpose and and what I wanted to achieve kind of in the long term. This isn't Jeopardy. You don't have to use the word strive for bonus <laughs> points or anything. No, I appreciate it. No, but yeah, I mean, that's a cool story. While we're here for you, I believe you witnessing that helped shape you. I mean, it wasn't like one of these stories, and not to say those aren't great too, but where your dad was just, you know, you woke up and you experience uh, uh, ex- like a success uh, financially, professionally from the day you were born. It's like you got to see him and quit. That's scary, but there's, he believed in himself that he was meant for more. And he's like, I don't like this anymore. And it goes back to what we were chatting on one of the stickers on the back of my computer. Like fun is the point you're, you should enjoy to a point. Like, I love what I do. Is there some things that I have to do that maybe I don't like, you know, t- come tax season and keeping my books and all that for sure. But they're, they're, you're motivated by your big why. So, I mean, you, you shared a little bit, but man, I want to hear more. Like, what was that like 
Uh, so we, I want to, again, I love, I visualize. So he w- was 41. How old were you? when I was we, seven. So yeah, you may have said that. Yeah. So man, that, so what was that? Like share more of that. I want to hear more of that story. Just like witnessing that. Cause that's not an opportunity a lot of people get. And I feel like that's why you are where you're at, why you believe in all these different successes from your health, professionally, personally, why you have, why you, why you w- probably wake up every morning maybe even if you're like a little groggy, at least inspired because of what you witnessed. If your dad could do this at age 41, why can't I at age? Totally. Yeah. So totally. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so, so he, um, you know, he was, I guess always, uh, and sometimes this, you know, happens, happens to me as well. I guess I get it from him sometimes, but, but, you know, kind of, kind of impulsive in a lot of ways. So, I mean, that's a pretty impulsive decision to do that, but it had been brewing in his, in his mind for, for quite a while, but it it profoundly shaped my worldview. I mean, that, that, as you're mentioning, yes, there's the some things that you don't like about about doing your taxes or whatever, but ultimately that work should be a source of, of meaning and, and fulfillment and even fun. And and so how many parents tell you, you know, follow your dreams and those sorts of things. But here's a guy who is going to do it and also going to take a big risk to do it. And I'm sure for you as, as well, right? Like I got to meet and chat your, chat with your kids as we were walking in today, right? And, and I'm sure as everything that I've, even just getting to know you through Facebook and seeing the things that you know you, you all are up to, the ways that you are leading by example in terms of health and fitness and, and putting family first. And, and I think that all of those things leading by example go so much farther than the words that you say or of what they should do, you know? Yeah. Something I, uh, and you probably heard it, but it's something I, I don't, I don't even know where it came from. It wasn't my parents. Uh, and, and cause my parents were the, and this isn't a diss on them. This is just fact. My parents did the best job they could, but it was there do it because I said so, you know, and I'm the big, you know, brat. And I, to this day, I'm, I always ask why. You know, like I did when I was an adult working for people, when I was in restaurants during college. Why? Like, why do this? So anyways, something with my kids is I I learned that like just by witnessing, because I'm just always been this curious, like little George, like this curious (laughs) kid. And I love to watch. I'm a people watcher, but not in any judgment, just like I'm curious. So I'm like, I'm curious with my kids. I'm curious about their movement, about what they say. And and from earlier on, I noticed like whatever I said was like they would do the opposite. I'm like, oh, that was like me. So that that's not weird. <laughs> it's frustrating as a parent. But then when I started doing things, good or bad, that I saw like they would mirror it. And it seems so obvious, right? Like you know these things and you've heard maybe even if you've never read a book. And then I just started reading I'm, I'm like started diving into like parent psychology books and mm. was like, okay, I know this, but like you want to keep reiterating and referring. So it's just I, I always every day I wake up uh, even if I make a mistake, like even if I lose my temper, let, let's be honest, if you're a parent and you've never lost your pa- temper, you're a robot, but <laughs> no, but seriously, like, and learning to even apologize. Cause one thing, my, one thing I, I learned growing up, like you, we put these parents on, or I feel like parents put themselves on this like superhero perfection For pedestal, sure. a lot of peas there. Uh, and I've never done that that I can remember. And it was always, you know, even though you got to, I had to, I realized I had to drop an ego. Like, you know, I have a lot more better days for sure, but I've had moments. And so when I have those moments, I go to my son or my child or whatever happened to, Hey, you know, your behavior, you shouldn't have done this behavior. I shouldn't have acted either this way. I apologize for that, but it doesn't negate what you did either. We need to all both learn from this. So, and I'm doing this. I even say I'm, t- I'm teaching you to apologize. I'm apologizing because I also want you to know that you're going to make mistakes too when you're an adult. So it's like one of those things. So I, I learned early on that they're like, they're, they're basically trying to mirror me. And so like the fitness thing, my son, like right now has set a goal. I didn't, I don't push him. People think I like pressure them, force them to do it. No, it's just mirroring. And they, they pick up, you know, if there's behaviors that your kids are doing and you realize they're just like yours and you don't like them just realize that like you know there's things that i've done so my son's like got a goal to do like 25 pull-ups by the end of summer so he's like wow. yeah like right like he's 10 like i was climbing trees what are you thinking of that like and he wants to get better at like rotational uh, movements because he plays hockey and baseball and all these things so anyways back to all that i'm sure you witnessing and how how beneficial that is so even though you're not a parent right i have no i'm not a parent no, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a four-time uncle i i hope, hope to have kids of my own one day but for now i'm getting practice with uh, with my sister's kids it, well they're mirroring you too because i uh i'll tell you one of my uncles <laughs> This is a funny story. <laughs> Literally, this is the only tip I can remember he gave me to get. He's a good dude, I think. 
<laughs> but the only tip he's like, it was in the middle of winter and I lived in the Midwest and, and, and this was, uh, I was, uh, we would spend our summers. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago. We spent our summers in Western Illinois and farm country. And the best tip my uncle ever gave me was in the middle of winter and we just got, it was a snowstorm. He's like, I'm going to give you your, uh, like, I forget his words, but it's like, this is the best life tip or something like that. Like, never forget this. And he's like, if you want to drink the best beer <laughs> after a snowfall, put it in the back of your truck and let it sit there. It's not frozen, but it's just cold enough. <laughs> and then he, I was like 12 and he gave me my first beer. There you go. So there you go. Like, Appreciate hey. it. But he was right. You know, I hated beer then, but like, I don't really drink it much now. But when I do, I was be honest, I think I got spoiled with that, like <laughs> snow frost course picture of a beer. Right, right. <laughs> but, Again, there's talk about good sorry marketing. Sorry to totally go off topic there, but it's just those things are popping. But you, it reminded me of another story too. So purpose. I, I don't want people to think they got to go be a rock star, be CEO of a company, run a podcast. I know a guy who was working on Raw Street making multi-millions who became a janitor of a school. I just remember this. I know this guy personally and he became a janitor of school and his life's never been better. And guess what he does? He teaches financial advice on the side to some of these high school kids like saving and That's things awesome. like that. So like, but he loves that there's purpose in his floors and creating communication and having bond with the students and teachers. So I just wanted to go on that. So health and fitness, let's get back to that a little bit. Okay. So, you know, you, you got your professional, you got your, you got the, has your journey in the fitness world, like influence and approach personal growth and overcoming challenges in like other areas of your life. You can briefly talk. hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, as you were mentioning earlier, uh, for me, definitely with, with soccer, when I was trying to, you know, get more fit, it, the only thing that I could think of to do was to practice running and get, you know, that cardiovascular fitness. But I really never, you know, as with football, you know, I think teams get together, they go to the, the weight room, those sorts of things. I had never set foot inside a weight room until I went to college. Uh, and I had one friend that was lived on, lived in my dorm hallway that was actually two that were, that were really into working out. One, one had been a wrestler and the other, I don't know why, how he got into it, but they were both really knew their, knew their stuff. And so that's how I got into it was I, freshman year of college was the first time that I ever set foot inside a gym. And it was, you know, I think for anybody, and I'm sure you find this with clients, right? Like people, if you don't necessarily know what to do, it becomes a, a sticking point that's keeping you from setting foot inside the gym. Cause you don't want to look silly or, or yeah, you know, you, you don't want a lot of resistance is put up for a lot of people cause they don't know what to do. And so they just don't do it's yeah. with anything, right? Starting a business, growing a business, learning technology. I mentioned earlier about going online. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, it was probably something that it without them to kind of show me the ropes and get me into it. I, I don't know what I would have done. Maybe, maybe I wouldn't have, you know, gone, gone along, along this journey, but that was, so that was the first time, you know, like I said, I, I had played soccer, done, done movement and that sort of stuff, done a little bit of running only for the sake of getting better at soccer. Um, but didn't really think more into it, into, it, into fitness until, until then. And, and so when I was kind of getting <laughs> into, into all of that, um, I'd say, so I, I guess, I guess another part of my story was, um, and, and this was, this was kind of the other, the other thing that I was going to mention along the lines of my dad was, so my, so my dad was, uh, he, I think I mentioned when he started his career, he was in social work, um, and was in what they call family systems therapy. So, so thinking a lot about not just the individual, though that's important, uh, but who are, who are you surrounded with and what are the kinds of things that are, whether positive or negative, but what are some of the dynamics there? And it's really interesting for him, the way that he kind of thought about that, then transforming that into how a business runs, right? Because a, a, organization has similar dynamics of, of the ways that people are interacting in a positive or a negative way. Uh, but the reason that he got into that was because he uh, grew up in an alcoholic family. Uh, his, his father was an alcoholic. Um, and, and actually he uh, has been, my, my dad found after, after going through this and, and kind of being a, a functioning, you know, high level executive and everything, but, but kind of recognized that he had become an alcoholic as well. And so he's been sober for 30 years now, 30 longer than that. Cause it was a couple of years before I was born. Um, so, and that's your dad, my dad. Yeah. And, um, and so I actually, 
I never really, you know, a couple times, but never really got into, into drinking or anything in, in high school. Um, and then, you know, in college kind of did the college thing and, um, the college thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, where, leaves, where you, that leaves room for a lot. <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I think you, you've talked a lot. I think everybody talks about it a, a lot in kind of the, the personal growth and, and development, but you've talked a, a, about it a lot with some of your past guests of the, you know, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with and that sort of a thing. And so for, for better or worse, the, the norms in college are, are, were kind of like, oh, everybody's drinking. Everybody's doing these, these sorts of things. And um, mm-hmm. I, in my, uh, I, I basically had had some, was was doing it too much. And not only, you know, it was, was it like gone? a bottle of tequila at night or what are we looking um, at? <laughs> I mean, it's to the, to the you point of, no, I, I, well, well, there was, there was a, there was a couple of times where, um, you know, getting, getting blackout drunk and, uh, and, yeah. you know, not, not doing, doing things Been that, there, uh, you know, getting, getting lost, trying to get home, all these different sorts of things. Um, and, and anyways, well, so I'm glad I, you're okay, man. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I get it. I've been there. Yeah. And so, uh, the first, the first time I, it was kind of like a, like a three strikes thing. Cause the, the, the first time I, I did something dumb and it was because I had been drinking too much hard liquor. So I was like, I'm not gonna drink hard liquor anymore. Um, and then actually on my 21st birthday, um, getting way too drunk. And then there was a, a third thing that was, uh, the night before Thanksgiving, uh, you know, everybody came home from, from college and got together with a bunch of high school friends. And, and, uh, that was not a great, uh, not a great night for me either. And so from that point on, um, again, kind of recognizing that alcoholism runs my family, uh, that, from then on, I didn't go fully sober, but I, I basically said, I'll never have more than one drink in a night. Um, and, and even then, I mean, to, to what it is now, it's probably, probably that one, that one in a night is maybe a half a glass of wine, like with a fancy dinner or something. Yeah. And, and that's, that's as much as I'll do. And so, um, you know, that, I guess, uh, at, at, with a lot of people, you know, it kind of have this addictive, uh, personality and, and there is, I guess, some, some genetic component to it, but, but also I think there's, you know, th- what you see and what you, what you grow up with and, and that, that it can pass on that way anyways. But I think that is when I really dove head on. I mean, long, long story to get back to where we were, but that's where I dove head in headlong into fitness was, um, I guess, replacing one addiction with another in some ways, no, um, I feel but that. hopefully, yeah. hopefully a, a healthier addiction, uh, in terms of really, really doubling down on fitness. And so, uh, a little bit moving forward from there, I had a, a girlfriend that always had wanted to run a marathon. <laughs> and so she, I, I kind of started training with her just to support her. And so you were in like, I want to run this. You yeah, probably, no, yeah. no, I was, I was doing it. Cause to, the sounds of it, you weren't like this triathlon. <laughs> Some people are just born that way and it blows my mind. They yeah. It, but it sounds like you're just supporting a girlfriend. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, thank just, you. I'm glad <laughs> to hear that. I really, am. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was, I wasn't even really into it at, at first. Um, and, and then it turns out she, um, after, I don't know, maybe like a month of training was kind of like, yeah, this isn't really for me. And I wasn't yet in love with it at that point, but I was like, I said, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it. You're like, competitive. Like, there's, there's a, I'm competitive. I'm yeah, also, I you know, I, I set a goal and, and I, and I don't want to let myself down. Uh, and so I ended up running a, running that marathon. And then from there I was like, I did find kind of get this, this addiction, but, but part of it was, um, one of the books that I read while I was training for this marathon, it was something along the lines of like the, the non runner's guide to running a marathon or something, something along those lines. And maybe a quarter of the book was about like the training plan and here's what you should do and here's how you should run and here's what, whatever. But three quarters of it was the mental aspects of it has to be. I knew like, you were going to say that. Yeah, yeah, of like how what what to think about what where where to where to go in your mind when you're doubting yourself. All these different sorts of things, and so that's the part probably de- actually definitely more than the actual running and the and the the health benefits. I guess were like a, almost a a happy side effect to the ways that I was training my brain. Mm-hmm. And so from there I was like, all right, what's next? And so the next summer I was like, oh, I'm going to 
sign up for a triathlon. This, this looks cool. Why don't, why don't we do that? And I was terrified, you know, especially the, the, lot, night, the night before, uh, like you probably just, have your strong area in a triathlon. And yeah. Naked, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, trying to, okay. Figuring out how to, how to swim, you know, I, I knew how to swim, but like, you, you know, doing not it, not triathlon doing it in, swim, in yeah. open water, <laughs> not, you know, so, you know, you could start swimming laps, but then you got to figure out how to do it in open water and everything. And I was, you know, nervous. Oh, I just hope I don't come in last or like make a fool out of myself. And it turned out that I did pretty good. I think in like, I don't know, got second in my age group or whatever. And I was there like, oh, go. this is, you know, at least something, something that, uh, again, training, training your body and your mind at the same time was, was a pretty cool thing. And then figuring out, um, which I'll get back to, but, but figuring out how to then take some of that, that discipline that you build and bring it into other aspects of your life. Um, so after that, that year of a Olympic distance triathlon, which is about a mile swim, a, a 25 mile bike and a six mile run. It's a 10 K run. Uh, the next summer I was like, oh, well, what else is there? And, and so I went up to, to do a half Ironman that the next year. And then the year after that did a full Ironman. And uh, so the full Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and then a full marathon. And I will say that when I when I checked that box, I was very, very happy to have to be able to say that I did it. But I did kind of fall out of love with the with the training aspects of how much there was to do for that. There's a lot. Like yeah. like I'd you know wake up on a Saturday and be like, oh, I got to go for a six mile bike today. Like that's my that's my weekend. Yeah. And I, go ahead. No. So I was just gonna say. So after since then, um, I've just refocused on just doing Olympic distance triathlons because that's enough to at least keep me training and fit and and all of that but without kind of it became a second full-time job it was like all i did that summer training was i i you know worked i slept and i trained and and so that that became a little bit too much for you know just balance but it was kind of cool to say that you did it no i think it is i think there's things and it's a learning lesson right you might realize okay i did it great awesome do i want to do it again you you you, man, since like, it seems like those days in soccer, you've had some just good self-analyzation, self-awareness. And yeah, I, we interviewed Eric Hinman on here. He's a good friend of mine, lives out in Colorado, or used to be from this area. He He's done like five. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. I listened to that episode. Yeah. He, and he, he lives east and breeds training and he loves it though. Like you got to really love it. And, that, and that's what I say. That's what I tell all my clients. Like there's things you have to do. Like we talked earlier, you know, like if you got goals, like my son, I, I, I think I said that before the podcast, he wants to do 25 pull-ups. That's his goal. I didn't put that in his head. He wants to do it. So no, it's going to take work and there's things that he's going to, he's enjoying. There's things he's not enjoying, um, but he's doing it and it goes with anything. Like, and I always tell people, you got to enjoy at least the main chunk of your health and wellness, like your fitness. If you're just doing it to beat yourself up, punish yourself. There's no, you're not going to commit a life term process. You're going to hate it. It's going to be punishment for the things you ate. It's going to be punishment for yourself. It needs to be a joy in there, oh, you yeah. know, like, and then you, you said it yourself there that you started to, um, not, you know, realize here is a time to ship. So <clears throat> earlier you said in the mental aspect, and I agree all of it, the majority of everything I made a post about this on social media. Like, you know, I even gave like my daily routine, like you could do all these things that you just find in the day, if nothing is good up in, up in here, up in the mind, then you're never going to really reach results to the capacity you could. The sustainability isn't going to be there. The so, sustainability. And you 100%. said where, so you said, so I'm curious, where did you go in your mind? For you said during, you said you had to go somewhere in your mind. So during, during any of it, I'm sure it varied. Like maybe maybe you're listening to a Pearl Jam album or singing <laughs> songs in your head or, or or maybe a favorite musical or maybe it was just like darn grit and you know self motivation. Yeah, I mean there's, there's binaural beats. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there's different aspects to it, and even the book kind of talked a little bit about this. Uh, you know, but it, but there's certainly sometimes distracting is is a piece of it, right? Like because part of it is. When you're running a marathon, sometimes the hardest part is to just to be on like mile one and be like, I have how many miles ahead of me? Um, you know, so so that's that's it's 
uh, and oftentimes when we set big audacious goals, right? Like if we don't have kind of checkpoints along the way or, or small successes along the way that can kind of keep us motivated, we're, we're likely to, we're likely to give up. Whereas, you know, at mile 26, nobody's going to give up on that last, you know, point two miles. Cause you're, you're almost there. So, so it's <laughs> a lot of times being able to maybe, maybe early on is, is, you know, distraction and not to think about it was part of the, part of the mental aspect, but you know, ultimately it's, it's connecting with the purpose of, of why you're doing this. It's connecting to maybe some having some of the gratitude for some of the people that are there cheering you on, whether whether just, you know, the people along the route or else your family and the ways that they've supported you and encouraged you through this, or even just the ways that they've supported and encouraged you in, in life in general to, to, to get there. Um, and one of the things too that I don't think was directly from this book, but I think you mentioned in one of your podcasts that you've done a little bit of of reading on uh, on stoicism, mm-hmm. and and so I, there's one one stoic technique that that really for me is really powerful uh, the the negative visualization. Um, so you know for for relationships they talk about sometimes even even if it sounds kind of morbid, but if you've read Stoics, you know that they can be a little bit more morbid. But you know, you think about well, knowing that you're all gonna die. Yeah. We're all gonna die. Knowing that we're all gonna die or, or knowing that, you know, that it and this is outside of, of running aspect, but you know, one of the examples that they might talk about would be like knowing that, you know, think thinking about, gosh, when my parent or my parent might die or whatever and, and and how that can bring you to be more present with them in that moment um and and i've always found that to be um again maybe a little bit morbid but thinking about yes they're all gonna die yes they're gonna die in and you of course thinking about your own death can also help clarify things help help clarify what's most important and in those sorts of aspects but in terms of bringing it how i kind of applied that in running was you know if i'm thinking about how my legs are burning or my lungs are burning or whatever, thinking about, man, when I am, I don't know, hopefully I get to be 70, 80, 90, who knows how old, but when I'm 150. Yeah. Yeah. When, but think, thinking about, man, when I'm 70, I would, I would kill to be able to be on mile 13 of a marathon right now, sort of thing. So, so thinking about some of the ways where how lucky I am to have a, or even, you know, for some people who have, whether injuries or, or things that they are born with or whatever, where they, where they can't do something like that. So thinking about how grateful I am that I can do that and I can push myself. And, and that is, is one that I, when I, when I need to, need to dig deep for, for some of those things can be really helpful. I, I love that you're already painting that picture. More people need to do that. Uh, that's what I really work with my clients to do because you, you don't realize how, um, maybe you do, but uh, for those that are listening, the reason I wanted to talk about this for a little bit is most people that I talk to in their initial don't even know why they come into the gym other than I want to be healthy and I want to lose weight, which is great, but that's surface level stuff. For me, you just painted what you wanted to be able to do in your 70s, 80s. You know, uh, I have a lot of goals. Uh, my son, who's sitting outside this room, yeah, my kids are with me, by the way, never set limits. You know, we're going to record this. This is the third time we rescheduled this and it's summer. Anywho, like my son wants me to live to 150 while I threw that number out. Hey, maybe I will. I'm not going to set lifestyle limits on it. But here's the thing. I know one of my many goals, uh, I see it. I've all, I just want to be able to still move pretty much how I'm moving now, be able to crawl and play with my grandchildren and not just sit there and watch like a lot of grandparents do. And, and for some, they can't help it. And I get it. And, 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 and I feel sympathy for that. But the thing is, or empathy for that. And, and the thing is like, I want, that's my goal. So my movement practice. So do I still lift? Yes. Am I putting up 500 pounds, 600 pound deadlifts like I used to? No, because that doesn't reach my goal of crawling. Do I still lift weights? For sure. Cause I love lifting, but like, that's what I want the paint a picture. Like, why are you here? Like that has a line. Like people do a lot of bodybuilding, but they have no goals of being on stage. So why are you doing bodybuilding? Not to say it won't get you there, but there's better ways. If you want to climb trees, if you want to do these things and I love that you're doing that. So you're probably lining your goals with that. Like you're you're not here to be a five-time Ironman, right? You realize that, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and that's, so. that's one. Of, that's one of the reasons that I actually, um, mm. I, I stuck with triathlons, even when I didn't stick with. Um, and not that maybe, maybe one day I'll you know, run another marathon or something again. I don't know, but the the triathlon was so much more um, sustainable in terms of 
being able to cross train and do different things that weren't so, you know, pounding on your pounding on your knees. If I, I know a lot of runners who, if running is their only thing, they, um, you know, it, everybody is on their own journey. Do it, do it, do what, what do is, you do yeah. you exactly. <laughs> but, but I know a lot of runners who spend more time injured and nursing injuries than, than actually being able to train and run. And so for me, for a being while, able that to, was like 75% of my clients who, when I was working at the Y was runners coming back from injury. It's yeah. a lot of them just that I was don't strength train, don't work on muscle development. And then we work on their gait. I could go down a rabbit hole on this one, but yeah, you're right. And so, mm-hmm. so for me, I mean, I, I it, people, it surprises people. Um, like if I go into my actual training plan, how running I, do very little of because I'm, you know, always, I I do a lot more biking and and swimming. That's still cardiovascular kind of fitness. And you'd be surprised how much the cross training makes, uh, makes the running part not too bad. So I don't run that often because I am thinking longer term, I want to be able to do this as long as possible. So, and, and you, you mentioned, I don't know if you, you listen at all to, uh, to Peter Atia, uh, but he is a, longevity expert doctor has a, has a great podcast. Um, and he calls it the centenarian Olympics. So what do I want to be able to achieve at a hundred? And that's what he works with a, with a client or, or with anybody. He just wrote a book. I haven't read, read the book yet. Um, but I've been listening to his podcast for, for ages share it later once we're done with this. Yeah. yeah. And, and so that's, but that's what he w- will talk about is what do you want to be able to do when you're a hundred? And, and so just like you're saying, you know, um, you know, maybe that means you don't run marathons every every year because that means that by 40, you're going to need a knee replacement or whatever, right? Or maybe that means, you know, thinking about what goals, what, what do you want to be able to do? And for some, that might be, I want to be able to, you know, walk my dog when I'm 100. And, and you know, for for you or I, you know, lucky to be uh, relatively young, I'll say, and, and healthy, you know, that, that we're able to, you, you don't even think about like, that's, that's not, that's not even a, that's barely fitness, right? I'm just walking <clears throat> the dog. But if you think about it for somebody of that age, the, the frailty, being able to like hold on to the dog, if they, you know, see something and trying to run and all of that. And so needing core strength, all that sort of stuff. So yeah. he talks a lot about, you know, really thinking about those long-term goals and, and what you want to do. And it turns out as well that, you know, just having a decent amount of muscle mass is one of the greatest pre- predictors of longevity because we lose it as we age. Yeah. I mean, these are all like within my wheelhouse, but like strength, grip strength, especially longevity, having muscle mass, like, you know, we lose muscle, but more and more studies are showing the benefits of having muscle, not only to live longer, to feel better, the endorphin effect, to be happier, less mental health issues. Not just lifespan, but health span. Yeah. uh, Hormonal balances, women lifting more. In fact, more research is coming out that women benefit more from lifting heavy weights per men. Men can do the CrossFit stuff. I mean, not to say don't lift heavy and you're not going to benefit, but man, for the, a lot of things you're searching for, it's really doing like, like cardio S type lifting, like cross training, you know, and we're women like doing you know, heavy per se for them. Now, if you don't like, we find it, but you're right. Like finding your deep reason why you're doing a lot of this and and, and knowing your big why, like, you know, you'll see me do a lot of different crawling, rotational stuff. Like I do some funky stuff. I even, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm even always trying to explore and perfect the way the body's meant to move, not how we are moving. If that makes sense. For sure. Um, So I, 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 I love that there, even the running thing. So for me, I started running, with my daughter, I, I didn't like running. I used to run. So I, I share this story. I started running uh, with her and it was like I was committed to it. And I, I, I fell in love with the feeling of competitiveness at a back injury last year, which I've talked about on here before. So I won't go too deep down in that. So I couldn't run anymore. We couldn't sign up for these 5Ks. My daughter's been upset. So I just committed to running at least a mile a day at the beginning of this year. And it just came to me like I, if I, I can't, like every time I get to two or three, it hurt. Now it's just like a normal thing. So that's actually on my list. I want to be able to just be able to get up and run. Now I can, I never could like mentally and physically, but now it's like, I could just, if I wake up in the, and crawl out of bed, I can go run a mile and I feel great. As is that, is that like, before or after the, the ice bath? Uh, after, yeah. Okay. yeah. My I'm, morning starts out with it. I'm jealous. I, I, you know, Come on I, over, I, man. I, I, I'm jealous. <laughs> I, I've, I've been thinking about it for a long time because same sort of thing. All the podcasts, all the people I listen to are I big will into the ice bath. I would be like a I – would, I would be – I don't know how – like whatever promotion. Like I would promote 
cold bathing. I started doing it for the mental aspects I was reading, and I still do it, but I found major physicals. Now that I'm playing hockey pretty regularly, uh, there's some soreness there, but I'll pop in that. I'm good. Uh, but literally... We talked about temper. Like I don't like my kids uh, were surprised. Not that I lose it, but like, I'm a dad with testosterone, and I'm 42. So there's moments, and I'm very passionate. So mine's more of a passion type thing. And so like, anyways, like I'm just able to like calm myself. I'm able to be in stressful moments most times, and just oh, and analyze. That wasn't always me. I was a lot like my dad. My mm. dad. Uh, was a re- is a recovering alcoholic, so I could relate to that story. Um, his motivation was my mom was basically going to leave him and take the kids, mm-hmm. and then he stopped, and he's been sober for, what, 50 years. Uh, and we'll get back to that because I have a question about that, but I love that. And we talked about death. Another thing I want to get back on was, you know, you said we're all going to die, and I'm reading this book, uh, and it, it, it interviewed people uh, in the latter stages of the life, and and one of their biggest regrets was not taking more chances. Mm. So we talked about that, right? Like take more chances, explore more. Like when you play it safe, I'm not saying you got to go jump out of an airplane or or do some of this crazy TikTok, Instagram stunts where people are like almost like I just saw one the other day where people are like death diving. Don't do that if that's not on your list. Like you don't. <laughs> but what is taking a chance? Maybe it's your dad at 41 quitting this job that he's doing really, really well at making a good salary. To, to do something different, you know, so take chance. And the other, this is from a different book that I read like a decade ago and they interview people, uh, again, the latter stage of your life. And one of the other things is like not spending enough time with loved ones. Sure. Not once people are like, I wish I worked more, I made more money. And we hear this, but we, we still fall into the path of society. Like, you know, and this is the life I live. I enjoy life. I take chances. Uh, I explore like this podcast was an exploration that's going really, really well. Um, but I wanted to go into a little bit more like, you know, having, I, I feel a lot of people can relate. Like it's interesting how like some people went down that path of alcoholism. You started to started to see the effects at such an early age for me, you know, I, I, I'd had a few moments, but even now that I have no appendix, like it just bothers me. Like it doesn't mm. serve me and it doesn't align with my goals. So it's easier. D- do I have occasional? Yeah. But I always like, even after one drink, it's like, it tears apart my gut. So I'm blessed to not have like people think, Oh, I'm so sorry. No, I'm blessed to have no appendix because it serves me well. Uh, but you know, you, you look at these things and if, if it's not serving you, it doesn't mean don't ever do these things. If you enjoy a glass of wine with or after dinner, like, you know, there's people in my life that I know that do do it. But if you're seeing it cause you not to make progress in areas or slow and, and it's cool that you're able to do that. And it's cool that you had your dad, uh, to witness that. So is there any, and things you'd like to share on that for listeners, viewers, give them some tips that uh, maybe live that lifestyle or are currently living that lifestyle that have a heart, like they feel they need that mm. and how you were able to like disassociate and move on from that. Yeah. I mean, so one thing, and, and I don't know how much science there is behind this, but I, I do know I, I read something that, w- that was helpful for me in terms of kind of behavior changes that there's uh, somebody was talking about. Uh, there's there's moderators and there's abstainers. And so for some people, um, and my mom would be in this category, for some people it's really easy to to moderate and be like, oh, I'm you know, I'm only gonna have uh, you know, one bite of dessert or something. And for for others, if they have the one bite, they're gonna have like like the whole tray of cookies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so for those people, they're oftentimes better as abstainers where they just create hard and fast rules and say, I'm, you know, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I'm not going to do. And so for me, just creating that rule of never in my life. I mean, so it's been, I don't know, uh, 15 years now that since I've had more than one drink in a, in a day and in, in an evening or whatever. And uh, so like creating that hard and fast rule for me was important. And, and I feel like I've also found that, um, in, in other aspects of, you know, some of the more positive things that I'm trying to do, right? Like I don't necessarily have to go lift weights every day, but I do, I need to do something fitness related every, every day, even though probably, you know, it'd be better in some ways to do a rest day or whatever. But for me, like I'll go do yoga or something because I, I I need need to to be able to, I need to be able to, um, check that box. Cause otherwise for me, I know that if I take a day off, 
then it's going to be a whole lot easier the next day to be able to justify taking another day off. Well, it's the mental health. And you talk about, you know, is it a healthy addiction? I think if you're addicted to anything, if you can't put it down, but I believe movement's one of those things where like, you know, I was addicted to like chasing pain and lifting weights. So, Mm. and now that I'm 42, I realized that wasn't always serving me. So, but yes, I checked the box of movement and for the parents listening out there, I always give a tip, like, don't feel you got to go to the weight room to get near your goal. Sometimes it is playing baseball or the sport with dude, your kid, like (laughs) Like I asked my kid, they wanted ice cream last night. I was like, well, you also want, uh, you said you want to play hockey in the drive with your dad. Like, what would you rather do? Like, I don't care. I'm not going to be hurt if you want to choose ice cream over yeah. me. Totally cool. It's like, man, that's the easy one. You know, and they and chose I- playing with me every day, like every day. Like, so you just got to move every joint every day is what I tell my clients. And mentally you're going to be closer to your goals and you're going to be more motivated. Like say you didn't get your lift in, so you couldn't make it to the gym. Say every single obstacle. Say you're a single parent with three kids and you're struggling here. And that's why I like say wake up early, but say that didn't happen. Say your line is like, say everything was against you. Could you go play with your child? Could you go walk the dog? Could you just take five minutes to crawl on the ground? Like you'll feel better even if it's a five minute plank yeah. than doing zero. Yeah. Is what I always say. Yeah. Well, and, and I guess some of that ties back. Um, so you mentioned in, in one of your episodes, like kind of being against, or, or at least, you know, having people think about about goals right and, and how sometimes thinking more about the system that is creating the goals instead of instead of sometimes sometimes the goals that we create can be limiting and so being flexible that you're you're mentioning and so we kind of i appreciate you for <laughs> taking that time by the way yeah no absolutely i need to go watch and listen for my own tips oh i said that <laughs> we um you know i i think so one of the things that, that we do at, at accelerate with with my clients that that i've you know was lucky enough from a very young age to to do just because my dad was you know, this was his company. Um, you know, so I was doing some of these things from, from an early age was what we call your inner compass. So there's, there's four points of your, of your inner compass. It's your mission, your, your passions, your values, and your, your unique ability. Like this, this unique ability is like the, the superpower that you have that sometimes you might not even appreciate about yourself, but that other people really appreciate about you. And so, um, we help clients to, uh, to create, this to really write down and spend some time reflecting and create what their what is their inner compass. But the reason it's called compass is because uh, you know you are hopefully trying to be you and and live your own life. And and a map is great if you're going over territory like charted territory that where somebody's already been. But if you're trying to navigate something brand new and set your own path, you need a compass. And and so rather than create some kind of uh, some kind of a goal. Uh, that might be might be limiting or maybe maybe it might constrain you in some ways instead it's it can be better if you have this compass and just like a compass you know you get off track you, you walk for a while you, you kind of check your compass and reorient towards that true north and uh, and then head in that direction and you're likely to get off off track again but then you gotta gotta reorient and so having this spent time to to really create this compass and to Use that as basically every decision that you make is a is a vote for uh, the person you you want to become, and so being able to check in with your compass and you know every every decision can either create more alignment or less alignment with who you're trying to be. And th- there's this cool thing that that I heard that the uh, Apollo astronauts on their way to the moon they were off course like 97% of the time or something because it was the first time doing this, right? And so they were off course and then they'd have to reorient and they had this very clear goal of where they're trying to go. They're trying to go to the moon. Um, and so it, it would be easy for them to reorient. And that's what I think the same sort of a thing is you're inevitably going to get, whether it's your your health journey, whether it's, as you're mentioning, you know, losing your temper with with a friend or with family or with kids or whatever, you're inevitably going to do things that you're, that you're not not proud of, or that maybe you were just being mindless and you weren't thinking about that, that longer term purpose. But if you've taken the time to really get clear on that, on that true North for you, um, being able to reorient and, and get connected to that. So we, you know, are working with leaders of organizations and sometimes they're surprised at how much time we spend just on them. And it's that that's part of our philosophy is that you first have to learn to lead yourself before you can lead others, before you can lead an organization, before you can lead, um, in the, in, you know, in the world. And so being able to have that clear purpose. And then part of what we try to do is to, you know, of course, help them align better with that purpose, but also hopefully 
help their other people in the organization find their own purpose and connect that purpose to the purpose of the organization. And I think all of that is really important. I like a ton of what you said there, but what I'm going to bring up is I like what you said. You, you have to learn to lead yourself before you can lead others, before you can leave the wor- lead the world. And I believe that in so many, like, I, you know, I tell my, my kids since forever, you know, uh, you got to be able to love yourself before you can truly love others, before you can truly love sure. the world. And then I also tell, um, uh, like people I've coached uh, professionally, you have to learn to follow <laughs> before you can lead. So it's it's interesting how all these things, I, I just wanted to point out that. And then uh, the alignment, true north. Yeah. I mean, while I'm a picture guy, like it, I, I just, uh, I'm about to publish a second book and most of my stuff was literally, I was sitting in the mag. So props to them. Oh yeah. For I just letting saw me. that picture you posted. Well, I put them in my book and I give them props as a thank you because I, they let me, they don't really like bring in much. And I just said, I'm writing this book and I can't do libraries. I like nature and I like like art, like, and art is nature and nature is art. Anyways, can I come in here? So, uh, yeah, I just posted that picture because it's like, um, I needed, I needed a muse, but like not everything. So while you're talking, what I'm saying is like, I painted this picture, you know, being an entrepreneur or whatever, like there's that true North, you know, where the North is, but it's not a straight line, you know, like you basically were pointing out. And so I'm picturing this line and while people are listening, basically of going up then down, then even going backwards and around in a circle, like this was what's going on in my mind. And that just for those that think it has to be a straight line and never go like, you know, there's gonna, the line's going to be like a, like a three-year-old who just scribbled, <laughs> but they eventually got to the end of the page. Like that's, that's what it can be. It may not always, that's been my story. And people don't always see that. You see the, the Facebooks and, and the social medias, but you know, it's kind of goes in line with your health and wellness from the triathlons to, 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 to these marathons and which I'm glad made me think of another story that I read in a book of like, I'm glad you trained for it. I read the story <laughs> the guy just did it with his friend and never trained, never even wow. ran. Uh, he was, he couldn't walk for two weeks, <laughs> but he finished. But anyways, like how, like, you know, I, I, what I was going to say was, you know, how have these just, um, inspired you to like, you know, you, like you said, you just started sharing on social media and like, how have these just, um, how do you maintain the discipline through like the training of those and like still your other passions of your personal and professional? Like, how are you able to do that? How do you continue to do that? Yeah. So um, one of the things that, that you made me think of is, is you were talking, um, you know, and, and kind of getting back to maybe being being flexible on a goal like like, you know, because you might have a you might be running a marathon or a triathlon and you. It, it, I think it's healthy to have like a target time if there's something that you're you're aiming for that, that you want to achieve in terms of your finishing time or whatever. But, um, you know, there's going to be like, for example, last year, the triathlon that I that I signed up for, um, it started pouring on the bike portion. So, you know, you know, right off the bat that you're not going to <clears throat> hit your goal time. You're not going to, you know, mm-hmm. have a, a PR or anything like that. Um, but there's still a whole lot of mental resilience in riding your bike through a, through a rainstorm and trying to, trying to get through that. And, and so one of the other things that, um, I've always had in all my marathons, all my triathlons, all my, all my Ironman, um, my like baseline level goal is never stop running. Um, you know, so it kind of gets back to your, the, your, I love your it. The, the thing. So like, I've never in, in, in my marathon, I never stopped to walk. In my Iron Man, I never stopped to walk, even if that means that I'm, you know, crawling and, and along the way that it barely looks like running and I'm, you know, barely putting one foot in front of the other and it's not as fast as I would want it to be or whatever, or I'm hurting. Um, that's one thing that I feel feel like I can control. And so I'm, I'm never going to stop. And for some, you know, maybe, maybe one day knock on what it doesn't happen, but maybe one day I get so hurt that I can't run. But even if I can't run, um, it's going to take a whole lot for me to stop at least walking to, to the finish line, you know? So yeah. kind of having that, having that mentality. But one of the other things that you mentioned that I wanted to circle back to was, um, you know, talking about the ways that we move versus the ways that we're meant to move. Right. And, and that was one of the things that you mentioned. And, um, you also in the, in the intro, I think mentioned that I'm the, I call myself the chief evolutionary officer. I love it, yeah. And, uh, and so being able, what, how I tie that back is, is, is thinking a lot of ways, you know, we, we're, we're not move. We don't move the way that we, you know, evolved to move. We don't, we don't, uh, eat the way that we are evolved to eat. And, and a lot of those things are, 
what they call evolutionary mismatches, right? So like we are because we came up in an environment where it was hard to find, you know, sugar and fat, we have this taste for it that makes us want want to have that. But now we're in an environment that's totally different. And so we are, you know, addicted to a lot of those those flavors because we're in this evolutionary mismatch. And and it turns out that um there's so many different aspects. Basically, uh almost all of the the maladies, whether whether individually or collectively as a society, are like due to these evolutionary mismatches. A lot of it is the kind of isolation that we've created for ourselves, where we're living in, you know, living alone or or you know, not surrounding ourselves with with people. Whereas we, you know, came up living in the, in these communities, right, where we were a part of something that was uh, that was larger than ourselves. Whether that was for for many, it might have been religion. For many, it it may have been you know other aspects of Things that even just I don't know if you've you've ever read, but one of the books that really got me into into kind of psychology was uh, Robert Putnam wrote this book called Bowling Alone, which was the the uh, he he looked at how civic organizations had declined over time. Basically, fewer and fewer people are a part of the uh, well. It's called Bowling Alone because he started off looking at bowling leagues. Fewer and fewer people were part of bowling leagues. And, you know, so now we're, instead of being in a bowling league or a rotary club or, you know, any number of civic organizations, we do more and more alone. Like we don't even go to the movie theater as much anymore. We'll just watch it streaming, you know, sitting alone on our couch and and those sorts of things. (laughs) And so um, there's all these evolutionary mismatches. And so being able to think about the ways that oftentimes the ways that we're we're meant to move, the ways that that we're meant to be around other people, the ways that we're meant to eat um, and realigning with some of that is is huge. And so um, a, a little bit more of, of kind of my story in terms of where how, how I went from, uh, I guess, like college is the last thing I, m- I mentioned to, to just a really quick version to get where we are today was that I uh, always wanted to join my father. So I, I went to, from a very young age, thought that that's what I wanted to do, um, went and got a, a business degree. They called it Applied Economics and Management. Uh, then I wanted to go get some outside experience before joining my dad's business. And so one of his clients for a very long time, Wegmans Food Markets, you know, again, we work with organizations to make culture uh, part of their competitive advantage. And so Wegmans, you know, certainly part of their secret sauce is their culture. And so uh, what they call Wegmans Leadership University, he created 25 years ago. And Mm. we've been, you know, part of uh, bringing 300 plus of their senior leaders through this 18 month training program uh, that, that he created. And so... Um, we basically, when we were, when we were trying to, uh, you know, work with, work, work with these organizations, I'm like, oh, well, it would be good to get some outside experience. What if I went, I went and worked for Wegmans to kind of see from the client side, what it's like to create culture in an organization and, and actually went, moved out to the Boston area when they were open up stores out there, um, to basically how do you start from, from scratch, you know, in a brand new store, start this culture. And, uh, and then I was home for, uh, Christmas about 12 years ago now. And my dad almost to a fault, never wanted to push me into, uh, joining the business, but he was like, you know, there's no reason you can't start your own consulting company somewhere down the line when, when you're ready. But if you want to learn it from me, it's now or never. And I'll give you like a five year no transition. Pressure. <laughs> and so I, that brought me back to Rochester pretty quickly. And, and along that five year transition of taking over for him, I actually, I, I was thinking about getting an MBA, but while I was looking at MBA programs, instead found this program in what they call uh, Applied Positive Psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, which is really just the science of of well-being and resilience. And, and so I was able to take some of these learnings and the latest science of all the, a lot of the things that my dad had been, you know, reading books on and, and putting together over the years, but kind of take it to a new level in, in with this program. And so really at the intersection of business and psychology is, is where I do a lot of my work. You were even mentioning, you know, the psychology of being a parent, the psychology, yeah. like all these different aspects. And so being able to take that and, uh, and, and apply that. And so based on 
that work. Um, I'm also writing a book, so I'm a little bit behind yes. you, but I'm but, but I'm on the way. There's no behind to, uh, to we writing. Did, we all start the race at a different line. To so. writing uh, for the evolution of business on how do how do we you know look at those evolutionary mismatches that we've created to create um, organizations and leaders and individuals that are contributing positive to society. Well, I'm glad you're writing a book. Because we got to wrap up this episode and I would love to have you on because there's questions about business I didn't get to get into. And how about this? And I'm saying this on this episode. So everyone holds me accountable. When that book is getting close, uh, reach out to me. We'll have you back on here. Sound Absolutely. Good? I appreciate it. Man, you had to, and I want to, you brought up evolutionary mismatch. I could have a whole episode on that. Um, but I won't go down a rabbit hole because again, we're rubbing out, running out of time. But yes, you are so right. We're in artificial environments. I just have to say a couple things. We are in artificial environments and we can't get rid of them, but I'll continually bring up the idea of community uh, and finding it, even if it's five people, uh, tribes around the world, indigenous people that still exist. There are decade long studies to show no issues of back pain, no issues of mental health, no Alzheimer's. Like everybody's kid is everybody's kid. If a kid is wandering off towards the lake or the river or the alligator, they're saving. They're like, oh, that's not my problem. I hear that every day. That's not my problem. That breaks my heart mm -hmm. because it is my problem. And this is where I get an emotional expression when I see that somebody says that about a kid. It's not my problem. This world is hurting and they don't know why. This world is highly medicated on antidepressants and sometimes it's rightfully so. This world is confused at why we're breaking apart mentally. And they don't know why and they're confused. It's pretty obvious. Now, I'm going to be sensitive here, but I have my mental breaks. I talk about it in my second book, but I have tools to offer and things we talk about. But at the core of it is the, the mismatch. We need to get more connected with the people. We need to get out in nature more. We need to move our bodies. We don't have to do bodybuilding. We don't even need a gym. We need to talk. We need to smile. We need to do this. We need to be around people of energy. You got me on a topic and I had to at least say, cause I would, it's like nails on a chalkboard. If I don't reach it, I will shift to a less sensitive. I'll ask two more questions. Oh, my producer will kill me <laughs> and then there will be evolutionary mismatch. But the one is jeopardy. I have to ask you, that's awesome. I just want to know what was the most valuable lesson you took away from that. Cause that's not an opportunity everybody gets. Oh boy. Uh, biggest lesson. So, uh, in full disclosure, I got absolutely crushed by a seven day champion who I'm going to say a seven year old. No, okay. no, he, uh, he, uh, you know, even the answers that I knew he, he had the buzzer timing down, uh, re real, real well. So even the answers that I knew I, I couldn't necessarily ring in for. Um, but I learned a lot about, uh, again, this could be a, a whole episode in and of itself, but about having a, having a growth mindset. Um, you know, that's a big aspect of positive psychology of, you know, whether you have a, a growth mindset, believing that you can get better with effort and skill and practice versus the fixed mindset of, you know, the, the limiting beliefs that we put on, on ourselves. And man, that was, I, I feel like I've always had a, a growth mindset, um, you know, but being able to take that to another level, because when you are on a show that's, you know, supposed to be measuring how smart you are right and it's going to be broadcast all around the country and i guess the world you know to in to some respects um that really will will test your ability to uh, to believe that you can that this isn't the ultimate measure of who i am and how smart i am and in in any of those sorts of things but i know you mentioned on one of the episodes that you have an aura ring i also have an aura ring so um but one, don't become addicted yeah, or obsessed well, well one <laughs> one funny thing is that my i so sometimes I'll, when I'm training, I'll like get on a, on a exercise bike and, you know, do, do indoor cycling. And when I was on the Jeopardy stage taping the episode afterwards, I, I saw that my aura ring and my, my phone asked me if I had been cycling because that's how, how fast my heart was wow. beating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty incredible. I bet it's just a cool experience. It was one of my brother's favorite show. It was one of my second uh, honestly, I love no whammies. I don't know why. I oh yeah. My, I love, I don't know. But anyways, so, 
And last question, I could ask a dozen more because I wanted to get into like conscious capitalism, positive psychology. We'll you do this a bit. again anytime. Yeah, but I want to. I want you're you're inspiring me to restart my podcast. So maybe I'll have you. Uh, on yeah, that let's. One. And maybe you have me. We talk about this evolutionary mismatch because it's like I was talking about like fake, love that. fake food, fake environments, all alone while doing this, and and we're wondering why. You know, we should dive into that. But final message or final thing is like you know, is there anything else or what message do you have for hope or you want to leave this audience of uh, strive. 365 as far as you know your story of inspiring others or how what's one thing that maybe you didn't get to talk about um i think it's kind of we mentioned it a little bit but one of the things that i I think is really important is to always lead with with curiosity um and and be running experiments on yourself i call it being the scientist and the subject um where you are the scientist you know you're going to run an experiment but you're the subject of that experiment and just always trying to try these things on yourself maybe you you know heard something in a podcast or heard something that i talked about that i do or something that justin mentioned that he does and you try that and and know that it may work for you and it may not but ultimately reconnect to what the goal what what the ultimate purpose is that you're that you're trying to achieve and and you know kind of check whether or not you uh officially do the inner compass that, that we have with accelerate or you just kind of have your own purpose written in in some other way but you just check with is this aligning me, uh, you know, creating more alignment or less alignment with that ultimate purpose that I want to create and just, you know, be, be in constant state of, of tweaking that in, in terms of running those experiments, but also making sure that you're taking the time to reflect on whether or not this is, uh, this is aligning with that purpose. Yeah. I love that. And I'm, I'm just going to add like two things, you know, alignment. And, and for those that aren't sure, like, you know, you like your values, your morals, you know, what you want to do. Like if you have hockey on Thursday, you want to keep that, whatever, whatever it might be, if it's community group or church, but also I'll say this, uh, cause I've been doing this for a long, long time is write things down. Like we got a phone. I don't want to ever hear it. You know, I hear my 13 year old like, Oh, well, I didn't have any pen and paper. You have an iPhone with a notepad. Oh, I forgot about that. So anyways, write things down. I write stuff. Even if it's in the shower, I'll like pop out. Like that's who I am. Like ideas for my book, ideas for whatever. It's a business idea. If it's the wildest things, like I got some wild ideas right now that look like they actually might happen in the next five years. It's crazy. Write things down and then, uh, don't be afraid to ask for help, whether it be a business coach, a life mm. coach, a friend, somebody to support you, because those two things are going to be super huge. Write things down and don't be afraid to ask for help. And like him said, alignment. Like if you do those three things and you just you move that circle, that thing, that zigzag three-year-old drawing that I talked about, and you just keep going true north, you can do incredible things. And then you can look back in your life. He's like, maybe I didn't do everything, but I did a lot and I'm really proud. That's what we want. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, no thank you again, man. End. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for being on here. This is a real pleasure. This was fun. Uh, man, this is really cool. I definitely want to hang out with you outside of this, man. I'm glad I got to know you more. Thanks again for being on here. And thank you for all the wonderful listeners and viewers of Strive 365. You are the reason behind this non-for-profit product that we are doing to help people strive every day. Uh, thank you again. Again, like, share, subscribe, because that is one simple thing that you can do to contribute to help other people. Like Andrew's already found value in some of our past episodes. There may be you didn't, but others can. And just by simply commenting or doing your part and giving us five-star reviews on various platforms can help get the message out that they were sharing here on Strive 365. So do your part. Thank you again. Thank you.